Good to see you out tonight. Welcome to our online audience, too. We want to uh, turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 3 and uh, maybe even get into chapter 4 tonight, Lord willing. Um, this is uh, the ongoing saga of the nation of Israel as they uh, move away from God and move toward um, a monarchy because they want another person to be their king rather than the Lord. And so God is going to raise up a prophet in the meantime, whose name is Samuel, after whom the book is, is uh, entitled. And so let's pause and pray, and then we'll jump into 1 Samuel chapter 3, where we left off last time. Lord, thank you for this time tonight in your word. Thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for being always so gracious to us. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us. Thank you, Lord, that you are forgiving and loving, and you're only a prayer away. We just love you, Lord, and we thank you that you're here with us tonight, where two or more are gathered, you're in our midst. So glorify yourself, we pray, and strengthen us as we open up your word tonight. Bless it, we pray in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. So chapter two, an unnamed prophet comes to Eli, who was the high priest at the time, and pronounces prophetically coming judgment from the Lord upon not just the nation, but in particular upon Eli and his family. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, have been disobedient to the Lord. They have been committing sexual sin at the house of the Lord with women who would come to worship. They have been helping themselves to the best of the sacrifices that are offered to the Lord. The Lord, the Lord sees this, the Lord calls it out, and he uh, sends an unnamed prophet to rebuke Eli. And we learn in chapter 3, we'll see in a moment, that Eli knew that his sons were living in sin and that he refused to restrain them. And for that reason, God is holding Eli accountable too. And so when we come to chapter 3, uh, there's a refreshing turn of the narrative away from this doom and gloom message of the prophet to now uh, a reference here to young Samuel. This young boy who is, uh, is one who has a heart for the Lord, whose mother, Hannah, has given Eli, uh, rather Samuel, to the Lord by uh, bringing him to the house of the Lord and asking Eli to raise him. She made a covenant with God that if she were to get pregnant after years of infertility, that she would dedicate this son to the Lord. And by dedicate, she meant, I will give him to the Lord for the Lord's purposes. And so she takes him after he's been weaned to the house of the Lord. And Eli raises him. This is a bold and courageous thing for many reasons. Number one, because Hannah is trusting the Lord with this vow that she has made to God, but she's entrusting her son to a man who hasn't done a very good job raising his own sons. And, uh, and so when we come here to chapter 3, now we are seeing here this, uh, the unfolding of the ministry of young Samuel as God raises him up to be a prophet for the nation of Israel. And so chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Now, in your Bibles there, verse 1 refers to Samuel as a boy. We don't know exactly how old he is at this point. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, says that he was 12, but we don't know for sure. It's not referenced in the Bible, but let's assume that maybe Josephus understood something from Jewish history that was not recorded in the Bible. So let's just say, going with Josephus, Samuel is 12 here. Eli is an old man, and he's uh, going to be mentioned in chapter 4, and his age is 98. And so it is believed that chapter 3 and 4 is not really separated by too much time. So it's safe to say that Eli, the high priest, is well into his 90s at this point. Samuel is around 12, and, um, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Uh, God was not speaking as often uh, and to as many. And so he's about to train the ear of young Samuel to hear from him. And verse 2, it says, And it came to pass at that time, 
while Eli was lying down in his place. And when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, I mean, the guy's over 90, so it's understandable. And verse 3, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, this gives us a little bit of a time reference because the high priest would light the menorah, the candle of the Lord, the lamp of God. He would light the menorah, the seven-branched candelabra, and then it would go out eventually overnight when the fuel or the olive oil within the candelabras would burn out. So it says, before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle, meaning this is somewhere around 3 to 4 a.m., because by daylight, the menorah would, would be extinguished naturally. And so it hadn't yet gone out, so this is around 3 or 4 in the morning, before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered. So Samuel says, here I am. And so he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. You know, so you got this 12-year-old boy who's hearing the voice of the Lord, but he thinks it's Eli. Because he, he hasn't heard an audible voice from God before. And so God's speaking to him, and Samuel runs into Eli. And he says, you called? And Eli says there in the rest of verse uh, 5, and, you know, he's over 90, so I'll give you my over 90 voice. I did not call. Lie down again. <laughs> and he went and he lay down. And then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And so Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now, Samuel, there's a parenthetical comment here. Samuel did not yet know the Lord nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So no, in Hebrews, yada. There's a difference between religion and relationship. There's a lot of people who know about God, but they don't know God. And that was the case here. You know, Samuel has been raised in the tabernacle of the Lord with an understanding of who God is, but he didn't know God personally. Give me one second. It was the old man voice that got me there, so I gotta, I gotta wet the whistle. All right. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, not in a personal way. He knew about the Lord, but he didn't know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And so verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Aren't you glad that when we don't listen to the Lord or understand that he's talking to us, that he still will go after us time and again? So God didn't give up. Like, here's the third time. And so he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. So now Eli realizes this voice that Samuel's been hearing is the voice of the Lord. And so here's what he says to Samuel, verse 9. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Now note here in verse uh, 10, that it says the Lord came and stood. The ancient rabbis said that this was a manifestation of God. And the language seems to indicate this because now it's not just the voice of the Lord, it's the presence of God. He stood there. Now, in what form did he manifest himself? We don't know. Did he take on human form? Was it just like the Shekinah glory? I mean, was it some aspect of that? Because, you know, no man can look straight into the presence of God. And so some aspect of God manifested himself right here before young Samuel and he speaks to him again, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. By the way, if you notice the exact wording of the instruction that Eli gave him, he didn't follow exactly word for word. Eli said, Tell, say this, speak Lord for your servant hears. And Samuel left out the Lord part. He just says, speak for your servant hears. Like, you know, he's 12. Like, let's cut him a break, right? He's probably nervous. I mean, if God showed up in, in your house, you probably would be fumbling to what to say too. But he is now ready to hear from the Lord. Now, before we see exactly what the Lord says, I thought this might be a good place for us just to kind of visit for ourselves 
uh, how we hear God's voice, okay? Because short of an audible voice, which I don't want to discount. I mean, God can still speak audibly to people because God can do whatever he wants. But more often than not, it's that still small voice of the Lord that we need to learn to hear. Because it's a rare thing, again, I don't want to discount and say that it can't be the case, but it's a rare thing to hear an audible voice from the Lord. There have been several times in the course of my life where I have really believed I, I've heard something from the Lord, but I can tell you I've never heard an audible voice. It's been something clear and distinct in my spirit, um, but the audible voice is going to be a rare thing. So for most of us, most of the time, we need to learn how to hear the still small voice of the Lord in the quietness of our souls. And I think this is a good place for us just to kind of pause. We'll get back to this and, and, uh, and see what the Lord said specifically to Samuel. But in our case, how, because I get this question probably second to the number one question I get is how can I know God's will? And then the other one is how can I hear the voice of the Lord? Because let's be honest, there are a lot of competing voices. We have our own voice in our head, our own little monologue. We have potentially the voice of the Lord. And we have, you know, the voice of the enemy. He can whisper. He can try to get in our, in our thoughts. He can try to influence us in different ways. And, and then we have, of course, the multiple voices of the world and people. So, you know, trying to sometimes sift through that and discern how, do we, how can we hear the voice of God. There are three things that, that uh, I have found helpful in my life that I would uh, share with you. Number one is the counsel of God's word. I mean, that's where it has to start. God will never say something to you in the still small voice or in an audible voice that contradicts his word. If there's ever anything that contradicts even the principle of his word, it's not from him because he will never contradict himself. But in Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp to my feet. In other words, that's a lot, a lot of God's word is relevant for the near term. It's a lamp to my feet. It's like what I need to know now for today. But it's also a light to my path because God's word gives direction for things down the road. But it's important that we immerse ourselves in the word of God so that we can understand the counsel of God and hear his voice through his word. Psalm 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. And so discerning the voice of the Lord uh, comes by knowing when we read the Bible, the heart of God so that we can then sift through those different voices to know, okay, this, this is consistent with God's word. So the counsel of God's word. Number two, something I think is also helpful is the comfort of God's peace. This is Colossians 3.15, which says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Just in a sentence, never go against your peace. When God gives you his peace, that's a way that we can discern the voice of the Lord. If, if it's absent his peace, it, it's just not of him. That doesn't mean that every peaceful thought you have must be from God. But the point is that if you ever have a conflict with your peace, you know, we, we say in Christianese, we say, I got to check in my spirit. That's what people mean when they say that. I got to check in my spirit. It means I, I have an uneasiness. So never go against your peace. If, you, if you're uneasy, then discount it. This can't, be, this can't be the voice of the Lord. And then number three is the confirmation of others. Now, in order to kind of keep the alliteration, I was going to go counsel of God's word, comfort of God's peace, and confirmation of God's people, okay? To kind of keep the alliteration going. But the fact is that God can confirm things to you and not necessarily through God's people. Uh, you know, in the life of Balaam, God used a donkey to speak to that guy. Point is, God can use very unsuspecting people, sometimes even unbelievers, to speak. And you don't even, they won't even know necessarily that they're speaking something to confirm God's uh, voice to you. But God can use people to confirm. Now, that's the key word, confirm. Please never take direction from people. 
Just chalk it up as confirmation from people. If somebody says to you, you know, the Lord, I believe, is speaking to you, and this is what God is saying, if God didn't tell you that first, you can just say thank you very much and tuck it away. But confirmation should be what follows God's direction to you. Because you have a direct line to God, too. If you know Jesus, like you can hear from the Lord directly. You don't need to be taking counsel from other people that supersedes what God has said to you or not said to you. So, you know, be careful that you don't take direction from people. Uh, They might be right, but you've got to test these things. So confirmation is what we need to look for. How does God use other people to confirm what he's already put in your heart? So I put Acts 10 up there as just an example. When you, many of you know the story of Acts chapter 10, you have this Gentile unbeliever named Cornelius. And he is a God-fearing guy, but he doesn't know Jesus. And he is uh, generous and, you know, he's, he's one of these good people, right? But he doesn't know Jesus. And there's a lot of good people who don't know Jesus. And um, when I say good, that's relatively speaking. None of us is good. There's none righteous. But there are a lot of people who, you know, they're, they're decent people. They're, they're virtuous people. And they do nice things. That was Cornelius. But he didn't know Jesus. And so while he's praying, the Lord uh, appears to him and uh, tells him, send some of your men up to Joppa, because Cornelius was in Caesarea, send your men up to Joppa. There's a guy by the name of Simon Peter and go get him because God wanted Simon Peter to explain the gospel to Cornelius and his family. Now, what God was doing with Simon Peter up in Joppa was this. Simon Peter was was praying and he has this vision of a sheep being lowered down from heaven. Inside the sheet were all these unclean animals. And in the vision, in the dream that God gave Peter, God said to him, get up and eat. Now, these were not kosher animals. So as a Jew, he should never eat those kind of animals that, were, that he saw in the sheep being lowered down from heaven. And so he, he, says, he says to the Lord in this dream, in this vision, he says, he says, not I, Lord. You know, I'm not going to eat anything unclean. And God says, don't you call anything unclean that I've called clean. And what God was doing was opening the mind and heart of a Jew by the name of Simon Peter to realize that the Gentiles were not these dirty, unclean people any more than the Jews were, that Jesus died for all people because all are sinners. And so as a Jew, Peter had to open up his heart to realize Jesus died not just for the Jews. He died for the Gentiles because he died for all sinners and we're all sinners. And what God spoke to Peter was, there's going to be three men who come knocking at your door. And when when you go down and you answer the door, you're to go with them because they're going to take you to Cornelius. What's the point? God was speaking at both ends. He was speaking to Cornelius. He was speaking to Simon Peter. Okay. Three guys didn't just show up at Simon Peter's house and say, you're supposed to come with us. And he went, oh, okay. And follow them. God had already spoken to Peter first. So when the guy showed up, it was just confirmation. So don't take direction from people as, as well-intentioned as they might be, but be open to how God might use other people to confirm his still small voice so that you can hear from him. And also Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 there says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So confirmation of others and comfort of God's peace and the counsel of God's word. Now, Back to our story here. So Samuel is learning to hear the voice of the Lord. In this case, it's an audible voice. And now the Lord is appearing before him. Samuel answers and says, speak for your servant hears. Verse 11 says, and then the Lord said to Samuel, the Lord, all capital letters, that's his proper name. So God is speaking here directly to Samuel. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle, or will, we would say today would ring. In that day, I will perform against Eli, that's the high priest, all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Or Hebrew can literally be translated, he did not frown upon them. And therefore, God's still speaking here, and therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Like, 
Eli's had his warning and he hasn't done anything. And so there's not going to be any atonement for this. I've made up my mind. Judgment has come into the house of Eli. And so verse 15, so Samuel laid down until morning. Now can you imagine you're, again, we don't know for sure, but assuming you're, you're 12, this is a heavy word. I mean, this is a heavy word from God. Your boss, the guy you've been serving, Eli, <laughs> I'm about ready to smite him and his sons, and there's no remedy. And I just want you to know, like God is telling this young boy, judgment is coming to the house of Eli, get ready. And so, you know, not only is Samuel no doubt awestruck by the appearance of the Lord, but now he's like burdened with this information. Well, what do I do with this? And so he laid, he laid down until morning, verse 15, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. So that was probably part of his duties while he's there just living with Eli, that he opens the tabernacle doors in the morning. And Samuel, notice, was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Of course, of course he's afraid. And then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Well, okay. I, I mean, I guess I got to tell you now when you throw it on thick like that. And then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So this is the beginning of Samuel's prophetic ministry. Now, he will also serve to be a judge in Israel, but his prophetic ministry is, is what he'll be known for most. And this is the first time. It's like God gave him a word and he is speaking forth the word of God. He is forth telling, he's being prophetic here with Eli, the high priest. And so, verse 19, so Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, everything that Samuel said uh, was not worthless, but had meaning and in significance. And then the next verse, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh which is where the tabernacle was, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Chapter 4. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Uh, now Philistines, you, you'll notice, uh, these are the perennial enemies of the Israelites. The Philistines, uh, that, the word Philistine is mentioned a little more than 150 times through First and Second Samuel. And... Um, they are um, a seafaring people, probably from Crete. They end up uh, live, occupying uh, parts of Israel along the um, coast of the Mediterranean that today is known as the Gaza Strip. That's primarily where they live. Now, do not confuse the ancient Philistines with the modern Palestinians. Th there are people who think that, and those who think that don't know their history. I even I even, you know, when, uh, when the boys were young and, and I was helping to coach their baseball, one of the other baseball coaches who was Jewish, you know, said to me about how the Palestinians are the ancient Philistine people. I said, no, they're not. And he didn't even know his own Jewish history. The, the ancient Philistine people no longer exist. They no longer exist. The Philistines, since about 650 B.C., have not been around at all. They ended up being wiped out primarily by Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Israel. The Philistines were seafaring people probably from Crete. Why is it that they're associated today with the modern Palestinians? For one reason, because the Palestinians in large part live along the Gaza Strip. So the location is the same and so people assume that they're the same people. They're the ancient Philistines. But the Palestinians got their name by Emperor Hadrian. The Roman Empire, when they subjugated the Israelites under the Roman Empire, Hadrian, in order to try to remove any vestige, any reference to the Jewish people, changed Judea to Philistia, 
Philistia, he named it after the perennial enemies of the Israelites. He gave the land of Israel a name to wipe out the Jewish reference and to give their enemies the name of the land. Philistia became anglicized as Palestine, Palestinians. And so it's a, it's a name that Hadrian gave, but the Palestinians are not the ancient Philistine people. They're two totally different people. And the Philistines are gone now. And so, but at this time, these are the arch enemies of Israel. These are the perennial enemies of Israel. And so Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. And then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So about 4,000 Israelites die here in battle. Verse 3, and when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Okay, now, because we have a 30,000 foot view here, we know that the answer is because the people are living in sin. You got, you got the high priest who doesn't even, you know, keep his adult sons in line and they're unrighteous and they're immoral. The whole, the whole nation is corrupt and they're not really following after the Lord. That's why they're they're being defeated here. Look, you know, <laughs> reverence for God, all right, when there's a lack of reverence for God, as was the case here, then you can't expect deliverance from God. If you don't have reverence for Him, you can't expect His protection. And the people here are perplexed. Like, how come, how come we lost this? I thought God was on our side. Now, in order to try to get God on their side, when they ask the question, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? They say, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh, which was in the tabernacle, to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, just a, a quick understanding of the Ark of the Covenant. When they talk about the Ark of the Covenant, this was a box, a box that measured about three and three quarters feet by two and a quarter by two and a quarter. And the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was made of solid gold with cherubim or angels on top. You can see their outstretched wings facing each other. And it was made of acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were kept articles of Israel's history. The Ten Commandments were in there, Aaron's budding staff, and a sample of manna. But here's why the Ark of the Covenant is so significant to the Israelites, because it tells us that God sits enthroned between the cherubim, Psalm 80, verse 1, and Psalm 99, verse 1. And in fact, we're going we're gonna to read it here further in chapter 3. In other words, that God would actually visit the people by His presence hovering over the mercy seat or the lid of the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was placed within the tabernacle and then later the temple in the most holy of holy places in the inner chamber. And once a year when the high priest would go in with the blood of an animal to make atonement for the sins of the people, God's presence would be there. And so the Bible says that God's presence hovered over the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. So the Israelites turn to each other, the elders, and they say, we've experienced this unknown defeat here at the hands of the Philistines. You know what we need? We need to get God on our side. It's like God in a box. We need to bring God in a box, and we need to bring him to the battlefield, and now we'll have victory. And so this is what they do. Oh, it doesn't turn out to work the way they thought. Verse 4, and so the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from, the, from there the Ark of the Covenant, by the way, the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned 35 times between chapters 3 to 6. They brought there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. There you have it again. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So you got, you got the unrighteous <laughs> along with the righteousness of God. And it says in verse 5, And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Because, you know, they're like, this is, this is going to be our deliverance. You know, we brought God in a box and we brought him here. And so, you know, they're all cheering like, ah, you know, they're roaring and the earth is trembling. Verse 6, And now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, 
What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. And so the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues of the wilderness. Now pause there. Now they don't really honor and ascribe glory to the true and living God because they're saying God's small g plural. But the story of when God defeated the Egyptians... When the Egyptians came after the Hebrew slaves, after God had delivered the Hebrew slaves out of the hands of Pharaoh, the Philistines are still referring to that story. And you know when that happened? About 500 years before this. For 500 years, that story has kept traction, such that the Philistines are still talking about it in this story. Like, you know what happened 500 years ago? Remember that? Yeah, because the hand of God was powerful and on display. But the Philistines are scared about all this. And so they, they try to encourage each other. Here's their little pep talk in the locker room. Verse 9, be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. And so, verse 10, the Philistines fought. And Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And also the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So this is a very tragic moment. Again, it is an indication that you just can't, you can't be living however you want and then just kind of call God in on it and think that that's going to make it all better. What God wants is repentance. What God wants is for us to humble ourselves and come before him, contrite, a broken and contrite spirit. I will not despise, the Lord says. So you can't just be living however you want and then try to fold God into it and think that it's all going to be better. That's what the Israelites were doing. We just bring out the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence is with us, then we'll have victory. And, and God, God's not going to acquiesce to, to their wishes here because they're not right with him. And so tragically, assuming that God's going to just, you know, deliver them, tragically, 30,000 Israelites die here on the battlefield. And what's also tragic is that the Ark of God was captured by the Philistines. And what's also tragic is that Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, died, and God had prophesied that. God had already said that Hophni and Phinehas were going to die. There's going to be his judgment against them. And so in the battle, the two sons of Eli die. The Ark of the Covenant is captured. And um, 30,000, now 34,000 total, are dead among the Israelites. This is, this is all very, very tragic here. Well, there's more tragedy. Verse 12, then a man of Benjamin, unnamed, a man of Benjamin, ran from the battle line the same day. And came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And now when he came, there was Eli, this is the priest, you know, the dad of Hophni and Phinehas. There was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. And then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? And so the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. And then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. 
and he judged Israel 40 years. It's a very sad day um, on many levels. And, you know, Eli has this tragic death here. He's, he's shocked, you know, perhaps he had a heart attack because it says uh, uh, in uh, the middle of verse, uh, where was it, 13, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And so maybe, maybe this news uh, about the ark of God being captured and the death of his sons just, you know, let, he has a heart attack here. He falls off, breaks his neck, and he dies. And, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. So it's a very sad legacy uh, at the end of the day. Um, Eli had been the, in this position for 40 years, but yet, you know, his, his sons had turned out to be very wicked men. Um, and here they all are dead now. Well, it says, let's finish out the chapter. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law, Eli, and her husband, Phineas, were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. So she goes apparently into like premature labor here. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, do not fear for you have born a son. So she's, she's dying in, in childbirth here, which is not all that uncommon back in that day. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. And then she named the child Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Now circle in your Bibles there, Ichabod. In uh, Hebrew, it's pronounced, the B is pronounced like a V, it's Ichavod. Ichavod means inglorious or without glory because the ark of the covenant was a symbol of the nation of Israel. And the symbol of the nation of Israel was the presence of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant was captured and taken into enemy hands, this, this was a national disaster. So Eli's daughter-in-law goes into premature labor. She hears this news. The Ark of the Covenant has been captured. Her father-in-law has died. Her husband has died. And now she's going into labor. And as, as she is going into labor and dying here, she names her son Ichavod, inglorious, without glory. God's glory has departed from the nation of Israel. It's the only time in the whole Bible where Ichabod is mentioned here. So for those of you who thought that, you know, the legend of Sleepy Hollow was the first time that Ichabod was used with Ichabod Crane, wrong. It's the Bible. But this is a statement of national mourning. The glory of God has departed from this place. And it was true. Now, I'll close with this story. Several years ago, probably more like 15 or 20 years ago now, um, about 15 years ago, I think at this point, um, I was taking a drive into DC with, with our son Austin. And uh, I said to him, hey, I wanna take you to the church that my grandfather built down in, in Northwest DC at the corner of Calvert and Wisconsin Avenue at St. Luke's United Methodist Church. And in the early 1950s, my grandfather, who was a, a pastor, um, built St. Luke's. And uh, so I said to him, have you, have you ever seen St. Luke's? And just give him a little history of his own family. So we drove down, we were going down DC and um, it was a Saturday, it was a Saturday afternoon. And I noticed when we pulled up to the church that they had a service going on. And we used to have a Saturday night service and we were in the old building and some of you have been moaning and begging me to have another Saturday night service back. Um, but until the Lord tells me otherwise, not gonna happen, but anyhow. <laughs> They were having a Saturday night service. And so I said, let's go on in, Austin. So we go on in, we sit in the back of the sanctuary. There was only probably about 30 people there, but okay. We're sitting in the back. The pastor, the lady pastor was finishing up her sermon. And at the end of her sermon, she prays. And she prays, listen to this, in the name of God, our mother. And I, I turned to Austin and I said, because, you know, I want to make sure, like, did she just say mother? He said, yeah, dad, she said mother. God, our mother. I said, okay. Then the service was over after she prayed in the name of God, our mother. 
had the band come up and the closing song was Elton John's Benny and the Jets. I'm not making this up. And I'm standing there and this thing is rising up in me because I'm thinking this is, you know, I have a little family pride in this because my, my grandfather laid the cornerstone of this church and preached there for many years. And now it's a place where they're praying in the name of God, our mother, and they're singing Benny and the Jets. And this thing was rising up in me. And Austin could tell, he's like, Dad, like, he's trying to calm me down. I'm like, <laughs> you know, doing one of these things. And so service was over. This man came up and I'm, I'm like standing, standing there like, you know, trying to hold it together. This man comes up to me. Hi, he noticed that, you know, we were new. Hi, introduced himself. And uh, I introduced myself. I was polite for the moment. And I said, uh, I said, uh, excuse me, did, did, the, did the pastor pray in the name of God, our mother? And he said, why, yes, she's my wife, the pastor. She's my wife. She prayed in the name of God, our mother. And I said, where, where in the Bible is there any reference to God in the female? And he said, well, you know, there is this reference when Jesus looked over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. And I said, yeah, that, that's an analogy to talk about the tenderness of God. But where is God mentioned? And about that time, then she walks up. And I, and I said, how dare you close a service with Elton John's and a vowed homosexual, his song, Benny and the Jets. And Austin's kind of standing there going, da, 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 da. And, I, and, I, and, and this thing rose up in me and I said, Ichabod is written over this place. The glory of God has departed. This is no longer a place where the word of God is being taught and you all are representing what is wicked and evil in the church today. And I just kind of like, I came unglued friends, I came unglued. And, uh, and sadly today that church is completely closed. And they, um, at least, you know, um, it's, it's been repurposed and it serves some good because it's a homeless shelter, but there's, but there's no church service that happens there anymore. Because the glory of God has departed. We cannot just thumb a nose at God and expect him to just bless our lives or bless our church or bless our nation. What God is looking for are contrite, broken people before him who are quick to repent and humble ourselves and seek his face. This is what God wants of us. It's a sad commentary on the nation of Israel, but it's important for us to learn from it, lest we be accused. The glory of God is no longer here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder. We thank you, Lord, for young Samuel, a man after your heart, a young boy that you raised up in the ways of the Lord, who will speak truth to a nation that has forsaken you. Help us, Lord, that never in our church, never over our families, would there be the absence of your glory. But Lord, may we always seek your face. May we be quick to turn to you, to repent, to humble ourselves. Never to ask you to bless what is sinful or inappropriate, but to humble ourselves so that we can be made righteous through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That we would follow after your ways. That we would cling to you. May it never be said Ichabod of this place. May your glory be revealed. May your presence be known. May you be honored and magnified, glorified in all things, in our church, in our families, yes, even in our nation, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse our hearts. Be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen.